Hey guys, and welcome back to Frontboards and Four Baggers. Uh, I'm Eddie from Cornhole Bag Reviews, and Corbin is actually out today. He got called in last minute, like 20 minutes ago, to go to work. So I'm going to be running the podcast today. We got two really special guests today. We got kind of part of the Zero Gravity team. We got Tyler Cobb and Jimmy Ewins, doubles partners that just kind of shot insanely well this whole year, but really showed up in a big way this last ACL Open. But how are you guys doing? Good, how are you? Good, how are you? Good, man. So I, I think we'll start off a little bit. So obviously you guys are teaming this year. You're on zero gravity now. You guys are throwing the Neptunes. You got like having a lot of success with that this year. But we'll start out just with this uh, Asheville Open that just happened this last weekend. I watched way too much of it from my couch. It was, it was really good to watch. A lot of really, really good games. But we'll start out with you guys in doubles. You guys really kind of broke through this event, had a lot of signature wins. But you took third place overall, which is crazy, uh, especially in how stacked the field was. I mean, you had Matt and Brett Guy. You had Jamie Graham and uh, Jordan Power, you had Cheyenne Reiner and Rule there. I mean, all the huge teams were really there. And uh, for you guys to get that win, um, especially throwing carpet, which I think everybody's kind of been throwing fast bags, and there hasn't been a lot of carpet success this year. So it's really cool to see uh, that consistency coming out of you guys from that. But we'll start for a little bit of you guys that didn't watch it. Like, you guys ran really hot until that first game against Birchfield and Gore, who ended up winning the whole event. But kind of what happened that first game? Did you just run into a freight train or? Um, we were both off that game. Yeah. For sure. Um, the whole day, like going into it and rounders and everything, we were throwing, uh, we were both throwing above tens and throwing carpet. And I usually try to like, like play a block style to the game. It's, uh, that's huge throwing tens blocking. So we we're both throwing really good. And then, um, we had a misstep, or not a misstep, but uh, an off game, um, our fifth or sixth game at rounders where we both threw nines. But other than that, one of us was throwing a 10 at least every game, except for, obviously, the Trey, Trey Birchfield game. And, uh, I mean, I, I know... A lot of missed opportunities. Yeah, go ahead. A lot of missed opportunities. Missed Early in the game, yeah. Early in the game, I uh, missed a couple. And then Jimmy scored. But, like he said, he missed a couple where he could have, like, instead of scoring two, he could have scored four. But I just... I, yeah. I started off by kind of struggling early. I couldn't maximize my points. So, like, if I could have scored three, I'd get one or 10 on nine or something. Yeah, and especially playing that, if you're trying to run that block play style against, I mean, because I think they were throwing Trey's uh, Birchfields. I know the uh, Gore is used to throwing carpet. He could throw Vikings stuff, but they were throwing the Surefires and just playing that slide play style. If you're really committed to that block and your block's slightly off and they're able to just bump you out of the way, the incremental advantages over time. So if you're slightly off on that carpet, I, I could see that. So slightly off that one game, you run into a freight train that end up winning the event, but you run into them in bracket and then you make a gigantic losers run. You guys drop into losers and just crush. You beat Sean Ryan Renner and Justin Rule, you beat Jason Tyson, Bobby Hunt, Josh Thielen, and Corey Gilbert. Then you had a gigantic win against Jamie Graham and Jordan Power, which I was talking against to Tyler right before this. That I think I think Jimmy, now you're being dubbed as like the king of the timeout. Uh, <laughs> I, but good. The last the last two opens, I have not. I scored every time I took a timeout. Yeah, the king of the timeout. Easy peasy. Time to get some merch. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> yeah. So uh, there was a huge moment in that game, if you guys didn't watch, where um, the momentum was really shifting your guys' favor. And then, so Jamie Graham actually tried to call a timeout on your first bag and actually set his bags down and walked to the side. And Trey's like, hey, or I think you called it out and you're like, hey, I don't think you can call a timeout like on my turn. And Trey's like, hey, he's got first bag. So then you threw your first bag, obviously made it. And then uh, Jamie took the timeout, but I think that mental of him having to step back, let you throw, make it, and reset the timeout when he came back out, it was almost like it was almost like the reset he was looking for from the timeout then kind of got taken away because it like got reset almost again. Did did yeah. you, did you feel like? I mean, obviously you were just following the rules. This is what's happening. But did you feel the the momentum sticking with you even after that? Uh, definitely. Um, so like, he took the timeout and he asked Ray, he's like, "Can I take my timeout now?" Like joking around i was like no you can't it's not your turn because like that's the rules and then um trey was like yeah he's right like you can't take a timeout and then um jason mccann actually yelled out just take a timeout after he's done throwing so then i threw my first bag in he jamie takes a timeout he comes back and he's like now i'm gonna miss my first bag <laughs> so, like immediately he already like yeah the mental is know, he's probably joking because like he jokes around like we joke around a lot yeah. so he's probably joking but like he ended up missing his first bag out i mean even if you're because i joke around a lot of two two and i play but we me and corbin talk a lot about um 
Cornell is so much subconscious too, because how much muscle memory it is and consistency. But if you have like anything in your head, like, man, this grip kind of feels weird, man. This is like, man, my hand's a little sweaty, like anything in your subconscious going on instantly that muscle memory is just that tad off, you know, which easily him joking around, it could still be there. Um, and I, and a lot of people were talking about the rules too. So I know in the actual rules, if you call a timeout and it's not your turn, you're like there that you could have asked for him to like negate his bag. I know you're not going to do that in the moment in the time. I mean, you guys were like good about like the big pressure situation, but, um, so anyone who was like, Oh, that was kind of a weird situation. It's like, well, actually you guys followed the rules and kind of gave him a little bit of a break on it too. And it ended up working out overall. And I think, you know, that's just a sign of how you guys were playing too, but you, you beat them go into uh losers finals, the third place game. And then you ran into Matt guy and Brett guy. And I, I think you like a lot of the game was around, um, cop or Tyler, you and Brett, because I think you and Matt were just like, banging him in like nothing you were just fighting for 10s and 12s constantly and then you and brett were playing a lot more of the messy game the airmail game you're going for some rolls and blocks and pushes where do you feel like that you missed still a couple opportunities in there was it the game plan that you wanted like did you want that messy game style absolutely that's what i tell jimmy all the time is like he either our game is i'm either gonna slide them all in or and he's gonna play the block game or he's gonna slide them all in and i'm gonna play the block game and that's what i wanted against brett i wanted I wanted him to block so that I could roll because I know, like, when you roll against somebody like that, they're going to freak out and get, like, upset and want to do too much. But I just had – I didn't have it that game. I didn't hit my rolls that I needed to, and he had to bite us. Yeah, yeah and he, he had to do I just kind of struggled. Yeah, and he was hitting some air mills here and there too. And, and again, with the roll shot, I mean, it stays on the board, but if you're a little bit off to the right, you know, he can just step out and keep pushing around all the time. You know, it's just, and, and the Neptune, I mean, we'll, we'll get into it, but it's 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 a great bag, but it's a little bit more thicker, puffier of a bag, a little harder to just push three of them in at one time like you might do with an incinerator or some of these faster bags. But um, either way, you guys had an insane run. You ran into a really good team. Uh, but even that, I mean, third place in the event, nothing to be shabby about. I think it's your guys' best performance as a team in one of these huge events, one of the big open uh, slash nationals, correct? We actually got a second got, place uh, in uh, Cincinnati. Oh, right. But, I mean, we it could be argued that it was our best. Yeah. It could be – because uh, this is only one bracket, right? So all the teams were in this bracket, where Cincinnati was multiple brackets. So you could have had an easier, quote unquote, easier game. Yeah. And uh, playing all pros. Yeah, and well, and, and I mean the the games that I listed off just your losers bracket run. I don't think any of those games were easy games. You know, I mean like yeah. like a, even a team like Josh Thielen and Corey Gilbert, which maybe people who listen to this don't hear the names all the time. They're not these big, but like Thielen this weekend was playing out of his mind like the whole weekend, like throwing insanely, insanely well. So all these teams are playing really good, but awesome doubles run. We'll go into singles a little bit. So Tyler, we'll start with yours. So you won your first game pretty easily. Then you ran into Josh Highland, who was on a tear all weekend. Like he just shot out of his mind. I think I. I mean, you might have not had your best game, but I think he just uh, – didn't he have a perfect game? He just didn't miss the whole game? game. Yeah. yeah. So, I mean – I also – I didn't put up much of a <laughs> <laughs> Well, okay. So, you drop in the quick losers there, but then it was just like seven straight. You beat Van Williams 22-2, Draven Sneed 22-2, and then unfortunately you ran into Tubby uh, 24-19. Uh, Corey Gilbert, who we were just talking about, beat him 22-17, a pretty tight game. Then Clayton Robert and then Tyler Parent and then you finally lost to Nico Morales who who ended up making the fi- or in the finals of their uh, semifinals of the bracket continue on through losers um, in a really tight twenty one to twenty game so like you had kind of that off game against Josh Holland and it seemed like something kind of flipped and you're just like all right well I might as well just not lose now <laughs> yeah yeah but, I mean I wouldn't say I like losing in the winners bracket because I mean you want to go as deep as you can in the winners bracket but I feel like every time I lose in the winner's bracket it's like something clicks in my head like all right i'm done losing yeah i can't miss anymore that's cool yeah, <laughs> yeah. i don't know and i think the hardest game of the day was honestly playing dubby yeah because i knew he, he threw really well his first couple games and then he ran into nico and he said he was just off that game he dropped down the loser's bracket and i said oh i'm sorry but <laughs> yeah i got i gotta beat you bro yeah. i don't know what to tell you <laughs> <laughs> we both we both didn't throw good and i think it was both because like in our subconscious we were like you know if i lose i'm gonna be okay with it. i mean i'm not gonna be okay with it but yeah but at like the same time you're gonna be like 
Sure. And and I mean like yeah, I, you I gotta be mad if you lose <laughs> He won't let you forget it if you lose w, to him in bracket, man. W will ride you all day. <laughs> exactly. Um, so, I mean. But I had a I had a chance in the, the fifth place game. I mean, yeah, the fifth place game that I lost. It was, I think it was 2020. And I had two air mills in a row. I hit the first one. And the last one was I could put it on the board for him to hit it for the game. Or me shoot it. And if I go off the back, all he's got to do is lay up. First thing that crossed my head is he's not winning the game for himself. I'm going to win it for him. So I should out there and I'll miss it. it happened. Yeah. And I agree with that because the round before that, he had, a, had an airmail backside queen for the win and he shanked it. So the odds are of him shanking it again. At least, you know, I think that my call was true. Plus, I mean, especially when you're at the level that you guys are at, like if you leave the if you leave the game knowing that you could have shot for the win but you didn't, and then you lost because of it, it's a lot different than being like, all right, if I miss an airmail, that's on me. Like I just missed the airmail, like mm-hmm. game's over, you know. But it's if you lay up and he hits the airmail, you're like, man, why did I not even try? Like that's such a waste. Exactly. So I can totally get that. It's but also, when you miss it and all I have to do is board it to win, like that's also. Just it also bad, feels yeah. bad. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I don't think yeah. there's a either way. I don't think either of them feel good to lose. You know, I mean, you know, if he, yeah. if you miss it and then he somehow goes off the side and you win, you'd still be excited. You won regardless of how mm-hmm. it happened. You know, I mean, yeah. it's just, uh, but like I'd, I'd still shoot the airmail, but I'd be worse. Like I'd feel worse if you boarded it. Somewhere. Like where is if I boarded it and you hit the airmail, I've been like, oh, man, I should have boarded it. You know what I mean? Yeah. And hindsight's twenty twenty. <laughs> yeah, exactly. yeah. Uh, but either way, crazy run. I mean, like, it, like yeah, you ran into Josh Howell, but then after that, it was again. You just like, I think it's like six or seven straight, just pounding through the bracket. And I, so that you end up tied for fifth, correct? You're tied for seventh or whatever yeah, in the bracket. Would, still, really good showing at the open, especially with all the competition there and the people you ran through. And then we'll uh, we'll go into Jimmy. So Jimmy, you had an insane run in singles. Uh, you started off. It's Carmen Superant. You won that. And then you had a really tough game against Josh Dillon. We were talking about 21 17, like early on, which I think for you to get that in the second game of bracket is a pretty brutal matchup. Second game. Same with you running into Josh Holland's second game of bracket, uh, especially for how they were playing that weekend. So for you to get past that one, it was almost like you got past that game and then you like not cruise control, but you were like, all right, cool. Now I can just keep like going because then it was you want to tear 24-2 against Duncan Clemmer who's no slouch 23-13 against Bobby Hunt 21-13 against Joe Neistead 21-7 in the King game against uh, or you lost the first in the King so you lost the first game against Brevin which I know or or in the uh, um Finals. In the finals, you did. Yeah, you beat him in the King Seat game, and then he came, sorry, he beat him in the King Seat game. He came back again, beat you in the first game, which Trey was talking about on the broadcast. You had a round where you had a bag hanging, and I think you went for the four. You had first bag, and you went for the fourth bag. Airmail and missed, and he slid in. You gave up a five, which like brought him back into the game. And Trey was like, "I don't know if I would have went for that airmail, would have slid in and taken the ten. And you know, I've watched back on that clip a couple times, and I, I think the way you were shooting, because you even said it Trey afterwards. I don't think I made one airmail that first game, and I, I, I think like yeah. if you hit that airmail, I think it's just your confidence level is so much different. And I think like it was so like even though it looked bad on the scoreboard, I think it was really important for you to shoot that airmail to like. Because the tide would have been so right. different if you four bag watch there uh, versus just so, getting momentum. I'm very cerebral. Like, I like to think, I like to play the strategy, I like to do all that. So, when I'm hit, I'm missing all my air mouse, right? That game, I'm hit, I hit two out of probably 12, if I was to take a guess. Um, so, if I'm a 50% air mouse, for argument's sake, right? And I missed six, right? So, I'm bound to hit my next one, is the way I look at it. Cause I'm getting back to that 50% average. Sure. You know what I mean? So by, and I wanted to maintain first bag because with Brevin maintaining first bag was everything to see whenever he had first bag, he felt confident. He'd lay his block down and then he'd feel so confident with push. So if I hit that air mail and I drag, I take the four bag or wash, right. Yep. Then I'm set up for maintaining first bag and throwing over the board, which is what I was throwing in doubles. I wasn't missing. Like I could literally put a hundred in a row. It felt like so it was the outside arm is where I was like giving up the points. Sure. So I felt like if I hit that bag, I throw another four bag in the next round, and maybe he doesn't throw twelve in a row. No, I mean it, it makes a ton of sense. I walked back. I mean, and, and then obviously game two happened. You win twenty three to two. So <laughs> so like yeah. I I mean I and and I hit every. Round. 
And yeah, and you didn't miss an air mail. And, and, but I think I, either you talk to Trey in between games or after game, you're like, that first game, I couldn't make an air mail. It might have been between games. But then, yeah, the second game, you come out and you're just like, yeah, and then I didn't miss an air mail. <laughs> like, so, yeah. but you got back to your 50%. You know, it's, 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 it's uh, what do they say in basketball? You, sh- you uh, shoot or shoot to get hot, right? Exactly. Keep shooting. <laughs> Um, but then you made, uh, made top four and then instantly ran into Matt guy who, I mean, Matt guy's on a tear this year. Just shoot. I mean, he's just not missing that much, but you, you had a pretty good game against him. I, I know you really were trying to get in that, like almost like the tempting block play style. You're really trying to get one, like almost in the hole that if he yeah. was slightly short, he's still pushing you in, but he has to backside airmail constantly unless he wants to push through and, uh, had a couple off here and there, which, which he was just able to capitalize on, but that's just, you know, his play style. He doesn't, he just doesn't miss. <laughs> Yeah, I agree. So, like, I played him probably four times, and, like, that was the only game that he, like, outscored me this year. Yeah. Right? So, I played him I played him once in singles and, like, rounders, or not rounders, um, 10-round game, and then we played him twice in doubles, and I, like, or three times in doubles, and I outscored him all three times. But, like, it, the, people say you just run bags with him and hope he misses, but, like, he's throwing an 11 over 40 in a row. Like, you can't do that. So, like, I try to... Um, exactly what you said leave a block directly on the hole and my bags are sticky and his like his weakness is pushing so he yeah. doesn't like to lay up so he'll either push through or hold him up and when he goes short you just clean up for easy two points you know what I mean? well that and um i mean to t- to his detriment i guess he- he'll shoot the airmail regardless like like if you have yeah. if you have a block anywhere he's just like i'm not going to block behind i'm just going to shoot an airmail and a lot of the time you know he'll shoot 75 80 percent airmails throughout a day or throughout a game. Right. I mean, he's just really good. But like, if you look at the game against Cheyenne runner in the finals, like he misses a couple air mills, she takes three points, miss an air mill, take three points. And it's just like that. Exactly. It, you have to force him to shoot because if you're just playing a slide battle, it's very rare that he will lose in just a pure slide off battle uh, against almost anyone. So, but you ran, ran really good. Uh, and he was just playing really well, but tied for third overall in a super stacked singles field uh, with a lot and and a really tough bracket. I mean, the t- people you had to run through were all playing really really well. So crazy crazy game overall and tournament. Are you? I mean, are you? Is this is that what you are you happy with the performance? Like, did you want? Obviously, you wanted more, but like when you finally sit back after the loss and look at it, are you happy with how the day went overall? Yeah, I mean, I can't be mad at the, how the day went. I threw well like throughout the day. Um, even the game I lost against Matt, I threw like a 10 something average yeah. just through an 11. But like, that was my highest finish in open ever. So I can't be mad at it. You know what I mean? Yeah. My goal is just to improve every, every day, get better. So as long as I'm improving my previous week, I'm doing good. It looks like Tyler, we lost Tyler for a sec. He should be able to join back in here. But, um, and I would say there's a couple highlight clips, not a couple, a lot. You're, cause I know I've, I talked to you, I happened to talk to you before this, even where I was asking you about some of your shots and your throw. And I, I was like, oh, do you roll? And you're like, oh, I don't throw a roll. I just throw a cut. Well, your cut pushes yeah. this weekend were bonkers. Like <laughs> some of the cut, like you're collecting Eric Davis bags, like from like the right side of the hole, right. like on these, some pushes, especially with a bag that's, Pretty smaller templated, pretty puffy. To be able to just come over there and grab what you were grabbing, it was, you had some ridiculous cut shots. Thank you. Yeah, I, I try to. So with that fast side, it's very controllable. Mm-hmm. So if you throw a good enough angle on it, it will cut. So with the speed of the bag and just you just have to throw the angle on it. I mean, it sounds simple, but it's, you just have to throw the angle and hit the bag perfectly, and you'll cut around it and push the bag. But no, I pride myself on that. No, yeah. I mean, I, I spent a lot of time trying to learn the roll bag, like a lot of time. And then it ended up, it just wasn't really for me. Not, not something that I would rather just airmail, to be honest. But in my process of learning the roll bag, I learned the cut bag. And I think having a good cut shot and it is just so important in any scenario, just being able to, you know, to, they, then blocks don't take away the board as much. Um, exactly. but you talked a little bit about the bag. We'll go into the bag a little bit here. You know, I, I like to review bags, so I, I couldn't go a whole podcast without talking about the bag you guys are throwing. So you guys are throwing the zero, to, zero gravity Neptune right now. We're looking at like a four speed carpet with a seven speed, a fast material, similar to a Viking. A lot of carpet bags use that seven speed material. In my opinion, it's the most comfortable bag in hand to throw. It just, it doesn't feel like any other bag. It's just it, like every right. handhold I make with it is just solid as a rock. Like it's just, it always feels really good to hold. Um, and then you're looking at that 85 bucks price point for anybody on their website. Whenever they do releases, they've been out for a while. One of the, Every Monday. Every Monday. 
Um, one of the things I actually wanted to talk to uh, you about specifically with that bag and going back to look at the other clips I've seen, you, you've thrown Reynolds in the past and you, you've kind of been on the throwing carpet for a really long time, even though your play style isn't that rolling play style, you've still kind of been in the carpet um, and a lot of your partners have thrown carpet over the time. Um, it blows my mind how consistently you play a slide airmail game throwing a bag that kicks as much as this bag does because if anybody who hasn't thrown a neptune before if you're and granted you have pretty high rotation and very very flat if you're not flat this thing's a kicking machine so it blows my mind that over the course of a whole tournament you could throw a 10 ppr with a bag that i struggled to even throw seven points with so throwing that flag slide play style so it's a testament to your play style but I, is there something about this bag do you just really like the blockability like what about this bag really tends to your play style yeah, so basically, this is the most consistent carpet bag you're going to find. If you throw a flat bag, it will go straight. That's It's that simple. It would, And that's what I like, because my bag rarely is not flat. You know what I mean? And I throw almost a uh, pancake level to the ground. Sure. And high rotation, it just goes straight. So that's why it makes it easy to run. A, well, not easy, but like easier than like um, uh, Reynolds, for example. Reynolds, they always kick left. No matter what, they're going to go left on it. No matter how flat, how hard I throw, they just drift left for whatever the reason. Um, I like them because they're slow, but yet you could still, they still a good collect bag. Like you yeah. can push through really easily. I mean, regardless, you have to throw it hard and hit the shot. But if you're hitting the shots, they're going to go. That's what I like about it. Like it's a hard bag to learn, but if you could learn it, it does what you want it to every time. Where most carpet bags doesn't do that. You'll get a weird kick. Or like you go to push with a fast side to like hop the hole yep. or bounce. Yeah, it th doesn't do that with these. But if you don't have a flat bag, these bags will tear you up and you will <laughs> kick all over the place. These are the bags that I use to warm up for events to see how well I'm throwing. Because <laughs> if it's not going in the hole, then I know I need to be a little flatter. Right. Yeah, no, Tyler really loves these bags too because um, they're easy to roll. Yeah, crazy so, easy to roll. I can't, I can't roll personally, but... He loves them because he can roll them so easy. And um, Storm Hogue, my uh, last year partner, he also has thrown zero gravity. He rolls these bags better than any bag he's ever thrown. Yeah, that, that's the one thing I got when I even brand new. I, I boiled them. Like I, I think I talked to I think I talked to Cobb about what do you do, and he's you're like boil them all. So I boiled them and stuff. And I'm not even kidding. Like. 10 minutes out of the bo or whatever once they dried i'm throwing these things they were like bouncy balls <laughs> I'm, like, I'm like i yeah. barely and i got and i have like full solid boards like the boards you guys are playing on which normally bags don't like you know just hop or anything because the boards are fine these things i was like man i can i can hop over bags <laughs> like without really even doing much effort on them yeah so it's all in how you break in your bags too um i don't like to boil mine i just like to throw them but when they're broken in they have zero bounce if you throw a flat that's what i like so like Vikings, I broke them in, and then they still wanted to bounce on me, even when they were broken in. Yeah, I agree. Like these bags start puffy, and they're like, because of the sand filled, they want to bounce immediately. But once you break them in, they play like tight to the board. Um. So, Cobb, you fell away a little bit. We just talked about. We we're just talking about the bag you guys are throwing a little bit, and um. We were talking about, I, I asked Jimmy a couple questions about it, but we'll go into So I know you come from, like before this, you were throwing a lot of BGs. You, you come from a BG background. You've been throwing carpet for a really long time. You were throwing a wizard for a while. Um, how is the trans, I know you really like this bag for the rollability. How has the transition been? And like, is this is this an easy bag for you to transition into? It was, I mean, it wasn't very hard. It took me, I would say probably a month because I ended the season, I started the season last year throwing Vikings, but I ended the season last year throwing Wizards. So it was, the only reason it was hard was because I went from throwing Wizards, which are a little faster, to throwing yep. these, which are slower. The main thing I like about them is I can, like, my set is really sticky, Jimmy, I'll tell you, my set, is, <laughs> my set is glue, but I can throw them as hard as I want to, and I don't have to worry about throwing them off the bat unless I just randomly do something stupid every now and then, but I like I mean, like you said, once you get them in, they don't bounce. And that's what I like. My thing was that is different from this year and last year. Is I would go to roll, and my roll is so exaggerated that, like, with BG, sometimes it would roll over the back of the hole. Yep. But with these, I can I don't have to worry about rolling off the back or rolling hard. You know what I mean? Like, they just, like, they don't bounce too much. They bounce just enough. Sure. 
Um, yeah, and maybe I mean the says I have like you know as as the negative of reviewing bags, I can't throw a carpet bag for like a hundred hours to get it to the point that it needs to get to, just break it in by throwing. But yeah. but I, I I have felt some like really broken insets, and like once they fully relax, I can definitely see where that with the big and I and I normally hate sand fill personally in any bag. But like this bag, for whatever reason, like I took it out of the box and I was instantly like, this is one of the best feeling bags I felt like it just the way that the sand works with that carpet. It's just really comfortable to throw all the time. Yeah. People, people compare it to uh, like a cat bag, but for carpet. Sure. That's the, that's the comparison because it feels like a cat bag, but it plays like a carpet bag. Sure. Yeah. The only thing is um, that four seven carpet is more like a two six uh, when it's broken in. Like it really, it really so down down. Good. <laughs> Storm, storms are like a point five. <laughs> things are like GoPro. Uh, and then the uh the fast side too i was talking to tyler about this before and if you get any humidity on that fast side i i think that i call that fast side a four when it starts to get humid out because i think that fast side starts to stick hard so i mean on the pro side of if you're super fast or super flat and you like throwing it super hard then I could totally get this, you know. I mean, it's just you just get to throw it as hard as you want all the time. I know you have a lot of high revs, and you, Jimmy, you release it really, really, really hard at the hole with a lot of revs. So it makes it so you don't have to like worry about flying off the back all the time, which is what you said, Tyler. But I can see how you transition into the bag. But we talked a little bit about the open, the bag. So I guess we'll start with you, Tyler. How did you? How did you get into cornhole, kind of, and like, you know, has your whole family just been in it for a really long time? How long you've been doing it? Like, you know, how did you kind of get into it? Oh, I mean, we started just like anybody else, you know, playing in, like, get-togethers, you know, playing in the backyard a little bit. And we were like, well, I mean, we're kind of – we can actually, you know, play. We can score. So we found out that they had tournaments, like, close to us in Mississippi. So we started going a little bit, and then it kind of started from blind draws. And then I finished baseball, stopped playing college baseball, and then I went to – like playing on the weekends all the time and started going to regionals and then started going to the conference and then going to worlds and then just just kept yeah. going. So when when did you know you wanted to go to go pro? Just like you just kept enjoying or like you play against good play. Like when was the moment that you're like, all right, I like I'm gonna try to travel and do this? Uh I would say when I won my first regional single. When I won my first regional singles, I was like Yesterday, because I was never good at singles. And <laughs> yes. won that. Yeah, yes. <laughs> this weekend, and he's like, "All right, maybe we should like, do this. I think it's working." Do it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but then I was like, "Yeah, I mean, I can. I feel like I can compete." So that's why I started chasing for it. And I guess, uh, yeah. same questions to you, Jimmy. How'd you get into it, and then how? When did you know you kind of wanted to do it? I was at a barbecue, and my a couple of my buddies were throwing bags, and I started try. I threw like. 30 foot in the air, just dropped them on the board. And uh, I was pretty good because I could put all four on. And then um, they started a league at a, like a local bar. The ceilings were like 10 foot. So I had to learn how to throw really low. And I would throw end over end. And then I would just, I would throw a roll bag, basically. <laughs> and um, I would throw them all off the back because of how low the ceilings were. I was throwing really hard. I'd step everything. Then um, a couple of like the, there was like, they weren't pros at the time, but they are. They were now. Um, showed me how to throw, and I like developed my own little style. And then I was able to get a flat bag. And then they're like, "Hey, come out to this blind draw." And then I went out to the blind draw, first one in 2018 January. And then um, I joined the ACL in that September. Oh wow! And I did a full season of ACL, and then I made back then it was top 16 in your conference, qualified for a pro or top 170 in singles. I was exactly uh, 16th in the Northeast. So I signed pro and then did a full season of that throwing game changers. Nice. That was my go-to bag. Yeah. And then I rotated over to Reynolds, the pro advantages, and played with Storm last year and then probably this year. See, I, I started with Game Changers as well. I actually just started uh, – well, I've been playing the same as you guys campsite, but I actually just started like – getting into it how we're out now like july of this year so i mean i started with game changers as well because it's like i feel like if you're a newbie game changers just do stuff that like you don't have to throw it near the hole it just goes in you just it's got a vacuum yeah. to the hole all the time but it's amazing that you went from game changers to pro advantages because i can't think of a polar different 
bag <laughs> from Game so, Changers to Pro Advantage. When I, when I started playing, Game Changers weren't out yet. They released in 2018, I think December, actually, for Christmas. They released. I could be wrong, but I'm pretty sure. So it was Slide Race. I had BG Slickster Controls, and I had uh, OG Razors. Nice. I used to throw OG Razors in singles. Shout out Maddie King. It was Suede, Suede and uh, Game Changer Fast Night. That's all it was. Nice. I would throw the hell out of them. <laughs> it's, it's crazy. How, I was talking to Trey in the podcast a little while ago. It's crazy how the game has transitioned from, you know, pro advantages and Suede to purely like vipers game changers incinerators like crazy fast bags now we're slowly trickling back to carpet slow block play styles like i'd say a good portion so. portion of people are Should coming up with that what i said i hope I so know. yeah me too and then Trey was saying too, because because obviously right now the roll bags like the talk of the game, like all the people that see it on TV think it's so cool that people roll over the top, so everyone wants to learn it and try it. And Trey was even saying he wouldn't be surprised if you know we get to sixty percent carpet players, and then you find out that a good chunk of them can't throw carpet, and then they go back to fast bags, and this will be over the court, and it'll keep doing that. It'll keep going back and forth from slow to fast bags over the course of time. But I mean, you even saying that twenty eighteen which I mean, I guess it's three years ago now, but two and a half years ago, you know, there was basically like no bags in the market. You had like suede, you had yeah. suede bags, you had a couple. And then now I feel like we have an overload of bags in the market, like more bags yeah. than anyone could possibly ever want to throw. I mean, I have a tub right here with 80 in it. You know what I mean? Like, if, you, if, you owned, if you owned a set of slag rates, you were a god back then. <laughs> <laughs> you, you had the cheat code material if you had slide rights back yeah. then. And then the Pro Edge Speeds came out, the Reynolds Pro Edge Speeds, and we played um, these brothers out of Delaware, the Miller brothers, and they were just they would just throw fast side, and it was they were like their original cat threes, like they would just fall in the hole. Sure. It was crazy. It's like it felt like these guys were cheating because we're throwing suede and they're throwing like, <laughs> yeah. these small rounded corners and they're just sliding everything around us. Yeah, I mean that's how it feels with game changers too. I remember I, I I was scrolling through Reddit, which Reddit's never good, but and no one who knows anything about cornhole is on the cornhole subreddit. But the the most popular post was like, "Can we are, are game changers going to get banned? These things are unfair." And and, like, yeah. and the comments were just hilarious because it's like it it was like early or late 2018, early 2019. People are like, they missed it behind the hole and it was sliding back down the board. <laughs> I'm like, yep, yeah, yeah. 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 <laughs> now that's where everyone misses. Yeah, well, and now that's what everyone's throwing. I mean, like the amount of if you had to look at the top 16 players just from this open, other than you guys throwing carpet, I mean, like you're you got like cats throwing like cat threes, you got like incinerators, you got uh the all slides you got you know vipers i mean no one else is throwing slow bags every single player is throwing fast bags i mean it's just why why not when it's that whole friendly right but but you gotta have the good we're talking about this the other day and i'm no disrespect to anybody but i I told you the other day if everybody had to throw the same bag and they were sticky me and jimmy win every pro national (laughs) <laughs> well when you look I at like it. i i kind of like that's one reason i like the throwdown because the throwdown everybody has to throw slide ride 2.0s or whatever the heck yeah. they were which i don't even know what speeds those were if they're faster they, than they're they were not slow they were not slow i don't care what anybody mm-hmm. says those bags were like medium to fast yeah yeah they but changed the it up with the it, it reminds it, it reminded me of like um a fire bag the, the starters oh, that's really? what it felt like in my hand yeah, and they were brand spanking new, like brand yeah, yeah, I heard that. I heard it's like I, I saw yeah. someone post that said uh, when you fly out to California, but you needed to bring your pot. <laughs> your, <laughs> like, I guess break crap in. Yeah, you got to fly out there with some bag breaker serum or something. Uh, but yeah, no, but I I agree. I mean, I I think it's cool how diverse bags are. Uh, I think at the the oh, same yeah. the same point. I mean. You know, we're going to get to a point, I mean, look at uh, Alex Hicks, right, throwing throwing carpet. And if you could throw 80% of your rolls, then you can compete with 80% airmails. You know, you can, if you could throw a perfect middle block every time, you you know, you can force them to shoot. So there's definitely, and I don't even think we're close to the peak of carpet and like slow playing like potential in terms of like someone throwing a perfect block every single time throwing a perfect roll every single time just like that consistency level and as i think we start playing more and more we're going to start seeing it even more consistent than we are now but uh, um 
So we'll talk about a little bit how, so what is it like being a pro? Now that you're a pro, you're going to all the nationals, you're going to all the open, like how much do you think you guys are traveling? Like uh, on average, is it every single weekend? Are you playing events at home? Like when you're not playing of opens, like what, what is it looking like now that you're pros? So there's, there's two types of pros. <laughs> okay. Yeah, I got it. There's, there's two types of pros. There's pros that will go to your nationals or go to your pro events. They won't travel because it isn't their job full time. And then there's the other pros that will go anywhere because they are bums like me. <laughs> and then, um, so we travel a lot. Uh, I would say twice a month would be a good amount of flying. Or if you're Tyler Cobb, you're driving 16 hours. <laughs> what do you um, not like planes? No, I love got a full family to go. Six people. In oh, family that go. <laughs> okay. <laughs> you packed the minivan. We drove to South Dakota. That was 24 hours. <laughs> You'll probably be driving to Iowa. I don't think he's yeah, going to Iowa. Yeah, we'll, we'll drive. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. But, um, yeah, so now we travel a lot. Um, this month, we're actually skipping uh, the Kentucky Open because that would be three Opens back to back weekends because he's going to his conference as well. So we had North Carolina. This weekend, we're going to Florida. Then it would have been his conference, which is like eight hours, give or take. And then it would have been Kentucky. And then there was the payout or the gauntlet. The gauntlet. It's like a big cash farm out in Oklahoma. Yeah, so we're skipping that. We're taking a couple of weeks off. And then we're going back at it again. Because uh, the first national is February 11th. So you guys are back at another Open this weekend again, huh? Mm-hmm. Yep. Crazy. I mean, it's def- it's definitely a commitment. Yeah, I mean, it's a it's a commitment, and that's what I mean. We've talked a lot. Uh, I've talked to a lot of different people, but like, we're slowly getting to the point now where you can do this as a job. You know, I mean, like, depending on your age and kind. I mean, like, if you're if you're, that's why you don't see a lot of people in their mid thirties that are pros. Because if you got a kid or two kids, you can't really support that right now purely on cornhole alone. I mean, like, and and you can't put in the time and the travel that you need to. That's why you see that you know, retire age or older on and you're seeing like the 20 mid twenties and under, because it's like, all right, well, I want to do this full time before I, you know, have X responsibility. But I think we're slowly starting to tie it into it where with sponsorships and, and TV time now and all this other stuff that you're slowly being able to do it as a job, which I think is, is where the sport needs to get to, to get to that next step of competition, especially just with how many events they're doing now and, and, and the time commitment you're putting in. I mean, like with how much you guys are traveling and playing, you couldn't have a, a normal full-time job with the amount of time you have to take off and travel. I mean, if you want to be playing, this much so um i definitely think we're getting towards that stage which i think is going to be huge for the sport i agree um so what what do you think is the thing that people understand the least about being a pro like what do you think people like underestimate that goes into being a pro you guys uh, you go first. i don't know i mean i think that it depends on like where you look at it from if you look at it from somebody that just watches it randomly on TV, they're probably like, oh, I can do that. You know? <laughs> but they they don't realize how much work actually goes into it. Like like you like you were just saying, this is, I mean, this is a full-time job. You have to put more work into this than I did when I played baseball. So, I mean, people just kind of, I feel like people underestimate it. But the people that, like, play, say advanced players or competitive players, when they look and see pros, they're thinking like they look up to us because they they appreciate how much time and work goes into it. You know? Sure. That's all just I mean, it all just depends on like where you look at it from. I I agree with that. Um it'd be like I'd say dedication would be yeah. put it in one word. Like I when I'm not traveling, um I go to physical therapy, acupuncture and chiropractor. <laughs> all in one it's an all-in-one place i go there like three hours a day and it really helps because you're throwing so much mm-hmm. and you have to stay loose because if and if i didn't go i would be hurting <laughs> <laughs> i have a back massage when he plays with me from carrying me all the time <laughs> yeah i'm all hunched over I'm all hunched over. <laughs> your backpack's not I'm big enough to eat. hold all the bags and tyler <laughs> <laughs> My chiropractor knows how good uh, my partner did by how hunched over I was. So, that Jimmy, what do you think is the hardest part about being a pro? Um, 
That's a good question. So I would say probably two things. Um, being able to consistently win against top level talent all the time. That's got to be, that's pretty hard to do. Um, cause any, it could be anyone's day. You could always have an off day. It's, and you have to throw, you don't have to throw your best game every game. You just have to beat your opponent every game. Mm-hmm. That's what some people don't realize. Like they're all posting about their PPR and stuff about like, uh, having PPR for an 11 over the event, but not winning. You know what I mean? Cause somebody just threw really good against you. So, so to maintain that, that consistency is tough. I, I was literally just going to comment that before you said it is because so I started doing, you know, vlogs, right? I go to blind draws and granted, I'm just a normal guy. I mean, I shoot like an 8 PPR, 8.5 PPR, like and whatever. And I'm saying PPR, but I'll have a game that I shoot a 6 PPR and I win, right? And then when I'm editing it, I'm sitting here like, man, I, I didn't shoot that good, but I watched the footage. I was like, well, it was a lot of blocks and I hit an airmail. They missed an airmail, right? A lot of, so it's like, so like, yeah, my PPR was crap, but I, and I think I said this in a review, I'd rather have a six PPR or a five PPR and win than an 11 PPR and lose. Right. It doesn't matter how well you shoot all the time. Yeah. I mean, I'd rather throw that. Yeah. Exactly. It, it, I wouldn't say it gets on my nerves, but it just like you, you see Trey and all them talk about PPR, this PPR, that PPR, this PPR, that, I mean, if you watch the game that not even just talking about us, if you watch the game that a lot of people play, they're not going to have a high PPR no matter what. Mm-hmm. Because, I mean, they're going to play the block game. They're going to play the roll game. My perfect round is throwing a 10 on purpose. Sure. Like you. Just block, roll, roll, roll. Leave it there. Just so they have something to go over. I mean, the PPR, you don't block. of course I want to have a PPR. <laughs> but. <laughs> See, personally, I think we need to switch the mindset to DPR over PPR. I think DPR matters way more than PPR. Uh, and That's what we play. Yeah, and, and I feel like, you know, it gets mentioned here and there, like, oh, like as the afterthought, like, let's look at the DPRs. But I feel like the first thing that needs to be is who's running the, who's over a 1.5 DPR in the event. Because that's who's actually crushing people. Because it's like, if you're a 1.5 DPR in the event, like against all pros, like you're playing out of your mind because you're like literally beating everyone. Uh, so with, with that, like... Uh, the only issue with DPR is if they're in doubles, right? And the highest DPR is a three. But you could have a three DPR and still went 0-2 yeah. because your doubles partner gave up a lot of points. So that's the issue when they look at that. They don't, they're like, oh, the highest DPR didn't win. But the highest PPR finished third. It's like, yeah. But if the highest PPR is a point zero one, and the guy in second, that guy second has a 1.0, that's a big difference. Yeah. No, I mean, I, I'm, it's great that we have all these stats. Obviously, everything's subjective. And usually, I mean, it does work out that usually at the end of the tournament, the people that have the highest PPR and the highest DPR are usually in the top at the end. I mean, there's rarely a time that someone who just crushes DPR loses and goes 0-2. It could happen, theoretically. But luckily enough, players are good enough that if you're shooting a 3 DPR, you hope that your partner's not losing you the game at that point. Yeah. <laughs> but um, but I agree. I mean, I think I think PPR is just a tough number. But I mean, to the average viewer and to the average YouTube viewer for me, you know, they're looking at, oh, you shot a 10 PPR that game. You must have shot amazing. It's like, but it doesn't it doesn't matter. My partner gave up 10, you know, gave up 15, you know, I mean, like so. But and then both of you have been in this. So what is it like playing on TV versus, I mean, granted, these are the canine streams. You have the stream court, but I think it's a lot different than the live TV, the audience, all that kind of stuff. So like what changes, whether it's mental, you know, physical, what you're feeling, like what, what's different when the cameras are on? Yeah, Doug. It's a big difference. It's <laughs> a big difference. I've, I played one time, but two games on TV. I actually played against Jimmy on TV last year. And the main thing I was thinking about the whole entire time, don't throw a short bag. Don't, throw a short bag. <laughs> don't front board. Don't bag Do on not TV. front board. Don't throw a short bag on TV. Everybody's going to laugh at you. you know? it, it's all about, like, mindset, you know. Like I tell everybody all the time, this game is so mental. If you have the right mindset, you can win. And you just get up there and you say, it's the same game I always play. They're just cameras. There's big cameras and I'm on a big stage and everybody's watching. But it's the same cornhole game you always play, no matter what. All you gotta do is throw the bag at home. 
And Jimmy Graham said to me, because I, I asked him the same thing, like, how do you deal with nerves when you get on TV? And without even, I think I wasn't even done with the question. He just goes, alcohol. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah, he's like, he's like, if they banned alcohol from ACL events, he's like, I would have to relearn how to play the game. <laughs> so, so for I me, I don't, I don't drink or anything. Year. I just you love the pressure. How he does it. You love the pressure. I just love the pressure. I want to be... 2020, hit a backside airmail for the game. That's what I want. I would I would play every game like that. I, I just love to be in that environment. Even if you miss and they lay on and you lose? Yeah. I would <laughs> but I want that. I'd rather have me hit the shot to win than have anyone else hit the shot to win. Sure. Mm-hmm. Um, and then, Cobb, so obviously you had, you had the pro shootout win. Um, and then do, do you think – Getting that, maybe getting over the hump, getting that event win on TV, do you think that helps going on TV going forward? I think it does. I really do. Because I got lucky, and the one time I did play on TV, I threw really, really, really well. So I feel like the next time I get on TV, I'll be like, oh, I'm already throwing good, so I can do it again. You know, it's Other than, like, contrary to if I got on TV and played terrible, the next time I got on TV. You're I'm nervous. Like, oh, yeah. Time. Last time I got on TV, I threw terrible, you know. But I feel like it'll help going forward, knowing that I did. Yeah, you got lucky. You got to beat us. Well, and then the, the like game that, that ML, I should have drug. I should have drug. Would have been. We would have been up one last round. So I'm like four bad. Yeah. Oh, well, and then so I, don't to block. I can't block. Do, do you I think- know you're fine. I'm all in. What do you think goes into – obviously, uh, I, I almost every pro I've talked to dislikes the 10-round format because it's not a normal game, a game of cornhole. It completely changes the dynamic of the game. How do you think – do you have to change what you're doing, your mental going into knowing it's a 10-round game? Like what changes when you get in that the, those 10-round situations? So you shouldn't change, but you do. So for players like us or like me, Tyler's sometimes lost, but – like, I live on the block. I don't want to run bags. Like, that's not where I want to be in this career. I just want to block and make them miss. I, it gives you, you can't like go for airmails. You should be able to because, like, you got to play your game. If you're scared to shoot, you're not going to hit any. But you, you can't give I mean? up big rounds. But you can't give up any round, really. You could give up a two, you could live off that. But if you give up a three, that's hard to come back from. Believe it or not, and because they're just going to run bags. Everybody's throwing fast bags nowadays. They're just putting them all in the hole. They're just filling up the hole. So if somebody gets, if you get up four points, all you have to do is run bags. You can miss twice, and you'll be tied. Like you know what I mean. So if you if you throw a four bagger every other round, you're already what in rounds seven, eight. Well, yeah, and with the with the players we have now, I mean, like. Almost every single, if not every single pro, can run forty bags pretty easily, like ten rounds. Just yeah. just run quick forty bags. Even throwing carpet bags, yeah. you could run forty bags pretty easily. I mean, like it's not. So I mean, I mean, look at a lot of the games. Like even the final against Cheyenne and and Matt, which which granted compared to the Alex Hicks one was like way shorter. I'm like, cool, I get to actually watch it and go to bed. But it was still twenty seven rounds. You know, I mean, and and that was like they gave up big rounds each way, threes and fours and stuff. Well, but I mean. That's almost three x a TV game. So I mean, like, there's so many decisions that are made that that can't be made on the TV. And that, talking to Trey, you know, they have to do it. You know, they can play three games in the time slot if they do ten round games. They can play one game in the time slot if they do ten round games. So it gets more people on the TV. But it's it. I don't know if there's a good way to balance having the TV and getting the games done. Yeah. If that if that was the case, though, where it was a ten round game, that guy would have won because he threw forty in a row. You know what I mean? So it's, it is what it is. I mean, that's why there's two separate events. That's why they have 10 rounds. And that's why they have just straight one. Nationals and two rounds. Yep. Um, it's different. So for either of you guys, do either of you guys have either people that are like, that you kind of have your foot on their throat or someone you throw bad against? Like, do you have anybody that you've just been crushing lately or anyone who's your demon? That's the opposite. Yeah, I got it. Jimmy knows. There's John no Kitchen. That I swear, this man is not going to miss a bag against me every time he plays. John Kitchen. <laughs> it's insane. Gosh. He will throw a six PPR the entire day, and I'll have to play him. I swear he won't miss a bag. <laughs> the same, favorite the same player thing. In the world. 
the same thing for me is Storm Hope. Storm does not miss when he plays against me. But just recently, he started throwing under 10s. Like, we're playing him three times, we threw an under 10, which is unheard of. He usually throws like a 10 5 and hits every roll bag and hits push shots up the bottom of the board. He goes stupid, but like now he's, he's starting to mess. So I think I got him. <laughs> you, get, you got him now. I mean, I'm the same with my doubles partner. I play against my doubles partner in, you know, random events and he'll be struggling and all of a sudden he'll shoot like a 10. 10 five. I'm like, what, what the hell, dude? <laughs> he's like, he's like, well, I'm not nervous about beating you. I'm like, but again, back to the mental game you're talking about. It's just that subconscious of like, well, I don't care if I lose, so I'll just won't won't miss. <laughs> yeah, I, I do. Say, I do have to say, I think I got Justin Stranger's number. Yeah, I think so. <laughs> yeah, like I played him six times recently, and he beat me once out of the six. All right, we'll put it down in the notes. He's losing to Justin Stranger next event. Uh, <laughs> you do you you actually do have kind of have Matt's in the doubles. Yeah, in doubles. Yeah, so in doubles. This last we, game I played Matt in singles was the only time he outscored me in his life. Yeah, which is I crazy. played him. I played him in Atlanta in singles. I twenty one won him in ten rounds, and then I played him three times in doubles. And all three times, I either had a, a ten, like the one time I had a ten point eight six, which was the same he had, and then I outscored him the other two times. Well, I mean, so. I and I think it it just comes down to, like you guys are one of the only teams. We talked about this a couple of times. You guys are one of the only teams that are still committing to the that are in the upper echelon of teams that are left at the end of the tournaments that are still committing to blocking, right? Where like yeah. most teams are throwing only fastbacks, and and I think I think when. Him especially, if we're just talking about Matt Guy, if he spends the whole day just hole for holing and just winning 25-round games all the time, and then now he has to shoot five times the airmails that he shot the other 10 games, you know, just because it's like, all right, well, block airmail. It's like eventually he's going to miss a couple airmails. And I I was talking – and like when you disconnected, I was telling Jimmy that he had some ridiculous cut push shots this this weekend. Uh, And and like – and I mean if you can clean up bags and clean up bags and force him to take a minute, take your three points so you can get them. Stay skinny. Stay skinny. (laughs) Every Um, time I I stepped out this weekend, every single time I stepped out to collect the bag this weekend, I always said, stay skinny, stay skinny. (laughs) Every single time. Oh, I do have to ask. There was one shot that you threw. It was almost like you tried to throw a roll bag, Jimmy, but you completely missed the rest of the board. You like threw the bag like vertically. Oh, like, yeah, like yeah, what yeah. was that? <laughs> and if so, he would have just did the threw, same exact shot he did the the bag before that, it would have went in. Those He's bags like, are so floppy. Those bags are hard. So we're throwing his floppy, his really floppy net. Yeah, <laughs> his he glue like, sticks. He boiled them. He boiled them like nine times. Nine nine times. They're actually fast. That's the set he has, which is weird. And they're really the floppy. But they, because the boards are sticky, they fall easy. You know what I mean? So mm-hmm. I threw two perfect cut bags around the block. And then he like blocked against, and I was too wide. It was like 12 inches. I had to cut around. And he's like, oh, I'll just do the same thing. And I'm like, I'm not Devin Harbaugh. I can't cut that. <laughs> so I I went to throw with a cut bag. And I knew I really need to angle it. And it just like fell completely out of my hand just like a vertical bag oh. that just like <laughs> side railed and just it was ugly because the commentators were like we're like i think that's his new roll bag he's working on i was like i hope not <laughs> yeah that is not my roll bag that's that's just molly busting my balls. oh okay because <laughs> i was like i was like that doesn't seem very very rolly to me <laughs> that normally that's normally what my roll bag was like yeah um is there a type you of player roll a little bit sometimes yeah sometimes uh, call back to your early days. You just throw it like this. You know it's vertical. Yeah, exactly. Mm-hmm. Is there is there a style of player that you dislike to play against? Like, do you like like whether it's someone who takes a long time to throw, someone who blocks all the time, someone who, like what's the type of style that you don't like to play against? I hate playing against cat fast bag. side cat bags. Fast side cat bags. <laughs> fast side cat bags. I've Very never bad. seen anybody miss so many bags in my life that's still going to hole. <laughs> it is crazy. They throw a bag more vertical than anything you could think of. And they will hit nine different spots on the board and it all just slides in toilet bowls, slides in toilet bowls <laughs> all around the hole. That is so obnoxious. We almost lost what game is that? Our second game of the bracket? <clears throat> second or third, yes. But I know who you're talking about. We played we cat bags. The two guys playing. The one cat dude had a good cat bag. 
yes. The one dude had a good flat bag I thought it was playing against. The dude I was playing against was throwing in a vertical and he was just sliding everything. He did not miss for a good five, six minutes. Throwing it vertically. And throwing it vertically, yeah. <laughs> and he didn't Big hit the time. same spot on the board once. <laughs> I would block, he would just go right through it, right around it. It didn't matter. So I'm like, okay. <laughs> and I'm just gonna put my bags in the hole. So mark, mark it down. Jimmy does not like fast side cat bags. <laughs> fast side any bags really that's just like where you miss. Like if you throw a decent bag, like I can respect it. You're fine. But like if you can't throw a bag, like I don't know. I'm yeah. biased. You wouldn't like my blind dress. <laughs> <laughs> I think that's 90% of the players vertical, vertical fast side game changers everywhere. Um, and I guess we talked about this a little bit, like you were saying that like competitive and advanced players, like look up to you guys, like being pros and whatnot, but where do you think is like, if you've talked to maybe people that are really good advanced players in your region or something, like, what do you think they're lacking to make that step? Like, other than the fact that they just don't travel enough, like the people that are actually just like not quite there, is it practice? Is it consistency? Is it mental game? Like, what do you think is the thing they need to step over? It's the mental game. Consistency. Yeah, and mental consistency game. in the middle game. The middle, the middle game. Once you get to our level, everyone can slide on your bag. Everyone can airmail. Everyone, well, most people can roll. I mean, I can. What separate? I mean, what separates everyone at this level is the middle game. It's going into a building, not being cocky, just being confident. I mean, you walk into the building. And you have to have the mindset of, I'm the best player in the building. No one can beat me. I mean, you're not going to walk around saying that, but you have to have that mindset. <laughs> it's all about the middle game. So I'll give you an example. There's a an advanced level player by me that went to the qualifier, um, didn't get in. I think went three and three. I forget what you need for the qualifier. Or four and two and was just like one of the ones that made it the play in, whatever. And he's really good local. But he gets in his own head. He gets nervous. He has like really bad shooters, and he can't throw well. So that would, when uh, on big stages, so that'd be a good example of metal game. And then there's consistency. There's people that can throw around me that like can beat me pretty often, I guess, if they were on, and I was like not throwing that good. But they only do it once every twenty times. Sure. You know what I mean? Because they're only on so once every twenty times. Yeah. Exactly. So it's just, and do you think, do you, I mean, what do you think, how do you cure mental game? Is it just putting yourself in more of the situations, just playing more? I mean, like, like, or, and same with consistency, is that just purely practice and getting there? Or is there a wrong type of practice? Like, you know, like what, how do you yeah. think you get past that? There's always a wrong type of practice um, doing anything like lifting weights. You could lift weights wrong, right. And you won't build strength properly. So same thing, there's wrong type, wrong type of practice. Like, if you're just, like, not focusing during practice, you're just screwing around. Like, that's not going to help you anywhere. But, like, if you're focusing, trying to hit the shots and, like, just shooting air mails or, like, crazy shots, but you're trying to do them, like, you're really focusing. That would be, like, a good type of practice. But, um, what you just because he's just back. Yourself. Oh, my God. No, go ahead, Ty. No, you're good. What you were saying about putting yourself in the situations, yeah, that, that'll help. But... The main thing to me is just being mentally strong. If, and some people just don't have it. Some people have to develop it. Some people, well, like I said, some people just don't have it. You have to develop that being mentally strong. Or nothing, like, you can't let anything bother you. That's what Bud Light's it's for. Hard. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> I heard they only had craft beer this weekend, though. It was awful. <laughs> Oh my is that why you threw good? You were, you were in trunk? No, I was more. <laughs> this time, wrong. Uh, yeah, he's 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 trying to drink it Bud Light style. They're like eight <laughs> percent. Uh, I was doing shots before and, we played the mark. <laughs> <laughs> I told my mom and dad when we got there. I said my worst nightmare at a cornhole tournament ever has happened this weekend. They're like, "What?" I said, "They don't have Bud Light." Why don't you just go to the store? Cause you, they won't let you bring it in. I know. Just go up to the car between games. That's a long walk, and it was cold there. <laughs> What's well, yeah, cold? Had, like, do you know how? Do you know what temp it is outside right now? Yeah, it, I know. It's, it's negative twenty. Like, okay, negative 20. what's cold? Yeah. 
<laughs> cold yeah, don't mean nothing. All the time. Negative 20 temperature, by the way. <laughs> Yeah, that's like that's insane. <laughs> yeah. But uh, yeah, it's sixty degrees, and I'm like, Ooh. yeah, no, it's, it's I mean, yeah, it's eighty two when you're wearing a sweatshirt. You're like, oh, I'm cold. Yeah, yeah. I, it's comical. I, I mean, I, I go outside in shorts, like to go get my mail. It's like negative twenty. I have shorts on because <laughs> I'm like, hey, yeah, whatever. I mean, it's it's below freezing here, and it's it's cold. <laughs> I mean, yeah. Uh, and then, so we'll get into a little bit here of uh, throwing styles. Because I think, Jimmy, you have a really interesting throwing style that you kind of found your own way. And Tyler, I think you have uh, not normal, but you have your own little quirks too that I like to get into. But uh, throwing style. <laughs> That's what he does when he throws his flag. Show him, Tyler. <laughs> Show him the stands. Yeah, yeah, yeah I know. Yeah. I, I was gonna get into that, but appreciate you, uh, you breaking the ice for me. But uh, so Jimmy, so you kind of do your grip. You do like a full wrap around, almost at the front, like uh, yep. on your bag, and then you do the step, which I think is becoming a little bit less common as the people doing the left and forward step. But the one thing that I wanted yep. to talk about that I've actually asked you about before that you didn't even realize you do, and you you just said you'd use it to get out of the way, but you almost curl your wrist up when you come past yourself. And then unload yes. it when you come through, which like no one else kind of like does the wrist cock that you do. So I didn't know how you developed that. And is it just like you just wanted to stop hitting your hip or like how did that start? Um, so I thought I was only, always holding it like outward. I'm gonna say, but I thought I was only holding it like that. I didn't know I was turning it down to go around my body. Um, just videos is where I, sure. where I learned it. I developed it what subconsciously because I, I was always hitting my pants like, and then like maybe a month later, I would never hit my pant leg again. I was like, oh, all right. And then I watch videos, I'm turning my wrist down. But it's coming back out. I'm turning it back up to the level, power level to the ground, and then it's releasing. Yeah. But um, I basically hold it like a circle change if you're yep. baseball. But um, yeah, and all my rotation comes from my fingers. I don't actually use my wrist. I just open my hand, I spin my fingers. Like I spin my corner finger. Well, and do you do you think does that curl get you a lot of the rotations in? Yeah, so I the harder I like bring my point of view in and my three fingers come out, the more spin it gets. Huh, interesting. So it's like I don't know, it's like, I don't know how to explain it without a bag. No, I, I've watched your like Jimmy one day. It don't work. When, yeah, when I've tried, so I was going through a throwing slope where I couldn't throw it flat. So I was like looking at different people, and your bag is like ridiculously flat. So I was like watching your videos in slow mo, and I was like, I don't know if that's the way I need to learn how to throw. But I reached out to you, and I was like, Why do you do this? <laughs> yeah, it's super complicated, I throw. But um, if you could get it down, it, your bag will always be flat no matter what. It works. So. It, it does work. Obviously, we know it works. But Tyler, so yes, first thing is you enjoy to like touch yourself when you throw. We, we've seen that. <laughs> uh, but, but you do the butterfly grip. You stand still. But you, your backswing, you have like a really long wrap, like almost like you could like touch your middle of your spine before you come around. Like, yeah. do you find that helps you like, like what, why do you have such a long backswing? What does that do for you? And because for me, I feel like it'd be a lot of room for error on the way back. around. You I, got a hairy lower back and it itches. When I was, <laughs> you scratch mid mid swing. Yeah. I was probably like six months into playing the game before I'd ever watched myself throw. And somebody came up to me one day and was like, "Why do you wrap the bag around your back like that?" And I was like, "What are you talking about?" Man? <laughs> and I was, they said, "What do you mean you wrap it all the way around your back?" And I said, "No, I'm going straight. I'm starting here. I'm going straight back and straight forward." <laughs> to me that's what it feels like i'm doing but exactly that video, feels like, straight back like. you're i'm not kidding you're like this far like, <laughs> yeah. your back. like i mean you have like one of the longest back swings like we'll be at blind draws and stuff and somebody would stand behind me and take a picture and my arm will literally be like touching the other side <laughs> yeah, I know. You're, like, you're like hey like, i don't how do you that. teach people to play straight back straight through <laughs> yeah. and when, when they when they go straight forward and straight back he says you're doing it wrong yeah it's like yeah. when i meant straight back i mean straight back from your left arm <laughs> yeah. um you gotta and touch that, your left elbow before you throw exactly 
Uh, so we'll yeah. talk a little bit. So obviously you were throwing Reynolds with Strom Hogue and then you were throwing BGs for a while. And then, and then Storm's come with you guys to zero gravity, but a lot of you guys came to zero gravity. You kind of got like a zero gravity family. Now I know you guys do a lot of stuff together when you guys are at events and, and been a really cool. So how did that opportunity kind of come along for you guys? Um, Tyler would be my, would be my guess. Um, I was partnering with, going to partner with Tyler for this year. And, uh, we had a few people reach out for sponsorships. I talked to a few companies that Zero Gravity gave Tyler an offer. And he's like, hey, like these guys are serious, whatever. Um, I'm going to have them reach out to you. And then they reached out to me. And by Cobbs, the end of Cobbs, we had to make it, we had to give them a decision. Or else they would have like tried to go somewhere else. And um, I don't know if you tried the bags. I like the bags. They were different than what they are now. They're all much better now, but like their bags before were not nearly as close to good as they were now. You talk about um, bouncy. I could roll over a mountain. <laughs> <laughs> so, and that's what one thing I was going to ask. Like, I mean, like obviously there's money involved, there's travel involved, there's all this other kind of stuff involved, but like, does did the bag play a big component into what you guys would pick? Like, I mean, like if obviously they offer you something absorbent, but I mean, like, is it really important to you to have a bag that you really think fits your play style? For me, um, I'm going to say no. Um, the bag was usable. The, the prototypes that we got, they were usable, but they were nowhere means like close to being like competable at a high level. But I'm fine adapting, right? So I've, I've never thrown it before. I would have adapted to anything. I might have even threw fast bags. Like I would have been like I would have been able to adapt. I would have been mad about it, but I would have just ran bags just more. Yeah. Let me same for you, same way. Yeah. But I mean, when I found out the bags were slow, you know, I was like, I mean, that's right in our wheelhouse, you know. Sure. And if they're slow, then we're going to be able to throw them. And then I talk to Matt and Sean on the phone all the time, you know, they and they were telling us everything they wanted to do, and I was like, man, it's sounds like a good fit yeah i've talked to matt a bunch matt's a really good guy and he also he just understands like business as well like like how to run a business because like i've talked to a lot of cornell companies that are really passionate about cornell but maybe don't understand like how to get you guys exposure more opportunities uh, to go do stuff and like they seem to really understand that and like you know they're bigger on the social media they got you guys out to visit with the washed up warrior guy you guys made some content out there and like just all the little stuff here and there to be able to like do some things they seem to be able to do which is really really cool but how did you guys um, yeah. And then how did you guys end up coming to fruition? I mean, was it just like you just known each other, you were friends, you wanted to be partners? Like how did it end up you guys actually partner? You want yeah. me to tell the story? Okay. Yeah, you tell this one um, the best. <laughs> we uh me and Jimmy met like last year, early last year. And throughout the season, you know, we just kind of got closer and closer at every tournament we went to, you know, you hang out with people that you like. Well, in Vegas, me and Jimmy both like to gamble. So we stayed at the blackjack table with Airwolf, Brandon Thompson from Airwolf. We stayed at the blackjack table with him for, oh, my gosh, so long, the whole weekend. <laughs> and Jimmy was like, well, you know, I live close to Atlantic City. There's casinos there. You need to come up and spend a weekend with me. We'll play some tournaments and stuff. I was like, all right, that's cool. I finally did. I went up there and we played like a tournament every day for like three or four days. And me and Jimmy both knew we were going to need partners for this year. And he was like, we were driving one day, headed to a tournament. He was like, why don't we just play together? I said, why don't we? He was like, let's do it. I was like, okay. <laughs> <laughs> Well, but I, I think that, that Matt, you know, I was when I interviewed Jamie Graham, <clears throat> we talked a lot about like partner chemistry and whatnot. And and he said like so him and Matt Guy are, are basically a business transaction. Like they're both just really good players that are paired up as a team, but they're not necessarily like outside the game, like bros hanging out doing stuff, you know. And then you have teams like you guys, it's just like you're just really good friends and that's why you want to be a team. But it's also worked out that you guys are both similar play styles, like similar bags, like kind of mesh together. But I think having that you know, bro mentality where you can hang out afterwards and like shake off a loss or, or give each other criticism and know that they're not, they're coming from the best interest because you guys are like friends is really important in a doubles team in general. 
And the main thing with us is we both have the same mindset. You know, we're going into this year, we both, we know that we can be a top five doubles team, and that's our goal is to be a top five doubles team. We both have the same mindset, same goals, and it, that's what works the best. Dubs. What do you think is the most important dynamic between a doubles team, whether it's bag, you know, like communication, play style? Like what, what do you think that makes the best doubles teams and the mediocre doubles teams? Because everybody's really good. So why do you think the best doubles teams are the best? You need one person <laughs> to run bags and one person to score. You need like not necessarily an alpha and omega, but you need one dominant player that's going to do the scoring and then one dominant player that's just going to, put bags in the hole because if you have two high risk players you will lose more than you will lose a lot of games yeah because one person will be off missing all those high risk shots most most of the time or if you just run i mean if you just want to run bags that's fine but like from a carpet standpoint you need one person to block so is this something you guys are talking about like going into a game like who's taking that role depending on who's shooting against who or is it more so like hey like this is your role jimmy like i i'm just gonna make bags you go for the risky shit or like it does that change like how, do, how does that dynamic so, work with you guys normally um <laughs> father's running bags and yeah. i'm usually blocking and scoring or trying to block and score i should say but um a lot of times like if i'm playing a guy that's hitting air mills or running bags like, we don't even need to talk about it. I'll start running bags, and then Tyler starts blocking and scoring. Or, like, if um, no, I'm off that game, I'll start running bags. And then he'll, like, notice the cue or whatever, and then he'll start blocking and scoring. I think it's hilarious that you... I think it's just hilarious that you're good enough that you could just say, "Yeah, if I'm off one game, I'll just start making them all," and then he can, <laughs> and then he can start to, because it's like around here, it's like, "Oh, I'm off one game, I shot a four. <laughs> you know, like, uh, but that, it's, all, it's all about knowing the game. You know, like if we're in the middle of a game and I see Jimmy, the person that Jimmy's throwing against, if he throws a block and they just go through it, go through it, go through it, go through it. He can't really do anything. Then I'm. I know that I'm gonna have to start creating a little bit. I when I try to block, I'll shank. <laughs> you can ask me. I'll shank when I try to block. But Lit. I'll just take a little bit off. Try not to throw a short bag, and it ends up as a block. That's what the practice is for, man. You got to practice throwing blocks. Oh, I do. <laughs> I can. I can block like crazy in practice. They, they come out as shanks. <laughs> <laughs> and it comes out like this yeah <laughs> rather than like that yeah you're throwing a block it's kicking off the left side of the board <laughs> from the outside yeah <laughs> from the outside yeah and uh, i guess that kind of leads into practice a little bit so i mean do you guys still practice just at home to practice is it mostly just going to blind draws and events just resting in between events like i mean what what is the current state now jimmy does not practice Nope. I only practice draw. at blind draws, leagues, stuff like that. Um, I can't focus just throwing by myself. And I have no one like I could just go and throw with. Um, I So like blind draws and leagues is when I get my practice. If somebody's standing next to the board, that's when I'm like at my best. Like that virtual from when COVID was around, I was terrible. <laughs> Like, I was beyond terrible. I think the one out of six or, like, ten events, whatever it was, I think I averaged an 82, which is competitive, according to the ACL <laughs> deck round. Yeah. So, yeah, I was not good at that at all. So, I only practiced by, like, doing blind draws, stuff like that. And does something um, have to be on the line eight. for you? Like, if you're playing against a guy who's just good just to yeah. play, or do, do you have to be playing a cash game? Do you have to be playing something for a purpose? Um, unless I want to really beat the guy, <laughs> uh, <laughs> then yeah, I basically have to play for something essentially in order for me to try. And what about it's you, weird. Tyler? I mean, I I Sorry, I didn't mean to cut you off. You could finish. No, it's like I tried, but I just don't have the right level of focus. If that makes sense. Sure. And Tyler, you got a lot of siblings, obviously, that are playing bags all the time. Are you guys throwing against each other all the time for practice? Yeah, mine is the same exact opposite. It's Jimmy. <laughs> I, that's all we do is practice. I mean, we where we live, it's 
if we want to go to a blind draw, we'll have to go, the closest place we can really go is New Orleans, which is an hour and a half for us. So we will go once or twice a week, but other than that, every day we're in the shop. So you're in the boonies. Playing singles games, yeah. (laughs) Yeah. Well, well, and then, well, at least you got a bunch of players that, or at least your siblings are good enough to give you some form of competition, you know, like. Exactly. And that's, I tell everybody all the time, that's why, like, no, I'm trying to say that today. But that's why we went from, like, within the short amount of time, we went from terrible to good because we have each other to play against all the time. We're all progressing at the same time. And it just, it's easier for all of us because, I mean, I can go out and play against pro caliber talent every day in singles games. If Tubby and Tyson are acting like idiots. Hey, I mean, as we saw in bracket, uh, you beat Tubby. So I, are you sure it's pro yeah, level like competition what? you got here? <laughs> like what? <laughs> but uh no i i don't really got anything else i mean i think we talked about a lot of stuff i mean congrats on the the event i mean you guys are obviously like the le- all the events this year so far you guys are coming out with a, a bang i think you guys are really fine found a bag that you're comfortable with you find like you're able to play the role play style you're i mean those things airmail drag really well cut really well like everything that you're trying to do with the bag jimmy it's working out for you you could still go hole for hole if you need to um, you know, so I think, and then as a team, you guys are just really solid as a team. The chemistry is there. Obviously you guys know how to, how to communicate. And it seems like you understand the game enough too, to know like, all right, our, we're changing like roles here. We're going to start scoring, yeah. do that kind of stuff, which, which is huge. And I don't think a lot of people understand that level of complexity when it comes to a doubles game. Um, and just understanding which one of your opponents is on, like you were saying, if he's pushing through every single block, be like, all right, well. Then, then you guys just start shooting because he doesn't care about the block anyway, you know? And so it's really cool hearing like it from good, your guys' perspective. Go ahead, sorry. A good example would be like uh, Matt. We played when we played Matt and Brett again. I'll bring it back up. Um, last, not this open, the open in Virginia Beach, right? So Brett was throwing really well. And Tyler was struggling a bit um, getting the bag to the hole. So he started running them, and then I just kept blocking Matt like directly in front of the hole, like perfect box. And he would hit one airmail. I'd like nudge it, double block. He'd go off the back or block behind, and I was able to score and score and score and score. And then we got to like 14 to whatever, and then uh, Brett had a round where he just fell apart and gave up a seven to Tyler, and Tyler hit like three rolls or two rolls, whatever it was, and. We ended up winning on a seven spot. So, like, in games like that where, uh, like, the next game would be reversed, uh, Matt was off. So I couldn't – all my blocks weren't working. I'd have to run bags. And then Tyler would have to, like, block it in the situational stuff to score. So if your that opponent's – I guess, I guess I'll guess i actually run another question. If your opponent's, like, off per se, like they're, you know, they're slightly off, they're missing a couple here and there, then are you just going to run bags then? Because you're like, well, you're giving me yeah. points. Oh, okay. So you don't need to yeah. – you're like, I don't need to make it dirty because you're already missing. Yes. Yeah, so if I feel like I'm going to outrun this person or, like, I'm, if I'm feeling, like, insane, like this weekend, I was feeling really good with my bag, I'll just run bags because I feel like I could um, outscore anybody that stands up. If that makes sense. If I feel like somebody's struggling enough, though, and I, I watched Jimmy play, and I learned a lot from Jimmy. But say they have a bag to the right, and Jimmy's already got one in. They slide one in. Jimmy slides one in. Jimmy will try to create more points by putting a bag yes. just close enough to the hole to where it's gonna be close. I mean, it's pretty much even, yeah. but at the same time, they can kick off. So. When somebody's struggling, you can kind of steal more points like that. Oh yeah, I call it the third bag block, man. I do it all the time. Mm -hmm. It's like you, you you just like especially because most people get in a rhythm. You you, okay? So you trade bag for bag, two bags, and I throw a third bag block, and then they instantly have to stop and think. They're like, "Oh crap, do I air?" You know, it's like and doing it in the middle of a round completely changes the aspect too, because they're like, and then usually in the fourth bag, they're completely out of rhythm again. I love third bag blocking. What what you do is you throw your first three bags really fast, and then you stop (laughs) on your fourth bag. And wait like ten seconds, and then you throw your fourth <laughs> bag in, and then they just shank the next bag. All right, so, 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 so go take a sip eat. of beer before my fourth yeah, bag, yeah, yeah. and I'll go like, go go reach my bag. Exactly, exactly. And then you put your fourth bag. You have to make sure you make your fourth bag. Yeah. yeah, yeah. If you miss, then you look stupid. <laughs> yeah. Or or but I was really parched. <laughs> <laughs> But 
All right. Well, I had a really, really fun time talking to you guys. A lot of really good insight. I mean, you guys are going to keep running good just for, I mean, everything you guys have been doing this year so far. I, I don't foresee that stopping anytime soon. seems like your mental game's in a good place. Tyler, you avoided the front boards on TV, so that's a good thing. I'm glad we made it past that point. So. Continue rubbing yourself when you throw. It seems to be working. Uh, and <laughs> But uh, but all you guys that are listening, appreciate you sticking around. Fairly longer vlog t- or uh, podcast today, but really interesting one. A lot of really cool insights. I hope you guys can get out of this. But appreciate you guys stopping by. Appreciate you guys joining me. It really was a fun one. But I will catch you guys uh, next week in the next podcast. We'll have Corbin back. But uh, thanks for stopping by, guys, and we'll catch you guys in the next one. Thank you. Appreciate it.